Hello everyone and welcome to Dope Talk Shanghai. So today I'm sitting with a very, very special guest, man. And can you first explain how long have you been here in Shanghai for? Been here for seven years. Seven years. And you have a company brewing, or is it, well, it's not brewing anymore. It's mature. Uh, hard to say it's brewing. It's it's kind of boiling and it's kind of uh, you know like evaporating. But yeah, it's, it's a non-profit organization called Green Initiatives. Mm. Uh, it's been around for about eight years, a year longer than I've been here. Um, but I think, yes, it's in the last one year especially have been super, super intense. Uh, so it feels like much longer than seven years. When you mean the last one year has been intense, how do you, can you explain that? Yeah, because, uh, so like I said, you know, Green Initiatives is a non-profit organization. Been around for eight years and our focus has always been on education and, and on, on action. But basically creating solutions to local problems. Um, I think it just so happened that until last year, we were operating more out of a personal bank account mm. or, or, or registration in Hong Kong. But after one point of time, we realized that the Hong Kong registration wasn't really helping much. Mm. Uh, so we r realized that we had to, had to, had to register mm. in China. Mm. Uh, and of course, because more and more companies were kind of realizing uh, the value of our work. Mm. And of course, you know, for that, you need to have a legal registration in China. So started with the legal registration okay, in so, China. So I'm going to break that down a bit because I, I don't know anything about registering yeah. from Hong Kong, yeah. China. First off, what was the difference? What was what was the decision I made? What was the event that made you decide to register from Hong Kong to Shanghai? Um, I, I think the key is that um, for eight years, right, we've been very community focused organization. Mm. So most of our work was just, you know, an everyday interaction with the community, uh, there was not a, necess a need for contracts and there was not so much payment involved. There were not so many big companies involved, right? So it was very, very grassroots. But I think uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, we launched our first recycling project in Shanghai. And it just so happened that because a, a trustworthy and reliable recycling project was a need of the hour and our project was very, very uh, transparent, I think more and more companies realized that finally these guys or green initiatives uh, it's gotten serious, you know, in the sense that it's not just lecturing anymore, but it's focusing on solving problems. So we started getting a lot of interest from companies who started, who wanted to work with us. And so suddenly we couldn't have used the same framework as in Hong Kong because Hong Kong was okay just to have a legal registration somewhere. But the moment you start working in China uh, and with a lot of companies in China, then you need to have a local framework and a local registration so you can create contracts, you can issue invoices, you can receive payments, so on and so forth. Oh. So that's what made us uh, change. So as you grew, you needed the official documentation for everything. Yeah, so you needed to be more local. As mm. Like we were in China, we were operating out of China, mm. so we had to be registered in China. Mm. So had, you, was, you was getting client or business to work with you in Shanghai or in China whilst in Hong Kong? Uh, sorry? I didn't so, because you was based in Hong Kong or did you just have that? No, so, so we were still based in uh, China. You were still based in China? Yeah. We were still based in Shanghai, yeah. It's just the registration happened. Uh -huh. So a lot of companies do that, you know, uh -huh. when, especially when they're start starting out, when the business is not so big, when the funding is not anything of a major issue, um, when a lot of the income is coming from uh, Western countries or Europe, for example, most of them just do the registration in Hong Kong because it's much more lighter, uh -huh. simpler, cheaper to maintain and manage the entire setup. Uh -huh. But the moment, you know, you start growing within China, then it's almost impossible to work without a local setup. Uh, so going back, would you have you know got your registration here in China from the from the jump start, or would you have done the same thing? You know, start in Hong Kong, work uh, your way up, and then going go to China? back. <laughs> going back, if I knew what I got into, I would never have done a local registration at all. You know, I would probably have just shut shop uh, because it is seriously, seriously challenging, especially for a small team. Mm -hmm. Or the other option is okay. So see, the option one is I would not have done any kind of registration here at all. Or I would have probably just left what I'm doing mm. or I would have waited until the time I got some really good amount of funding mm. so I could have a full-time person on my team mm. who could, you know, manage all the operations and invoicing and administrative stuff. Right now, I'm, you know, kind of the creative person in the team. I'm kind of the speaker in the team. I'm kind of, you know, doing the marketing. Mm. I'm kind of managing the invoicing and the operation stuff. Mm. So it gets really... You're, you're a one-man band. It gets, I mean, I have interns and volunteers. Uh. But because everyone comes and goes, there's no one yeah. permanent for like seven mm -hmm. years. I'm the only one who's able to do it with a little bit of support from some friends and volunteers. You know, I'm the only permanent kind of source. So it just becomes a lot of work and responsibility. Uh. I mean, it's almost like at this point of time, less than 30% of my work is real, you know, like development and sustainability focused work. And 70% of my work is administrative work. Mm -hmm. And it's a pity. It's so pretty. what's what's 
the most difficult challenge, you know, for you know, as you manage clients, you know, do administration, design. What what's the most like time consuming or most difficult thing that you have to tackle every day? Um, I would say the end, the 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 onboarding process for a client. I mean, once a client says yes, let's work together, right? From that point onwards, too. Like we have standard contracts, but then different clients have different needs. Mm. They have different backgrounds, so you have to fine tune the contract. Mm. A lot of times you need legal advice for that, and we don't have any legal person on the team, so we check with different friends and partners in the industry. Hey, is, does this make sense, or does it make sense? Mm. And so you send the contract to them. They send it back to you. You send it to them. They send it back to you. Mm. Contract has to be in, in English and Chinese, so mm. you know you have to make sure every contract is bilingual, mm. and then you have to issue the invoice. So then, because we don't have a full time team, we actually have an agency or a consulting company. Mm. That helps us with the invoicing. Mm. So we send an invoice request to them. They make the invoice. They send it back to us. We send it to the company along with the contract which is chopped. The company sends us back another copy of the chopped contract. Yeah. And at times there is a small error in the character of the company name in Chinese, mm. or you've missed a bracket or something. And then you have to cancel the contract. So you take the contract again, send it back to your accountants. They cancel it. They issue a new invoice. They send it. It's an it's a never ending process. You know, wow. it's insane. And and maybe it's much more challenging for me because you know so far we've been. Around like the legal registration has been around only for eight or nine months, but even at the same time, I think it shouldn't be so challenging. It shouldn't be so complicated, but it just is really complicated. You know, but contracts are important. For example, I just do simple videography, right? Yeah. And even with videography, I have a certain terms of what I yeah. I have to protect myself. Yeah. So for example, if I'm if I'm doing a video for a client, I will shoot the video and I will allow for them only one edit. Yeah. To pay. Yeah. But then I have to make that very, yeah. very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's just if if it's that simple. So if you're handling, you know, thousands, you know, of R and B, I'm assuming that's why. No. So uh, I'm not saying contracts are not important. I think there are a few different issues here. I think we are a very, very small team. Uh. I mean, the the way we work is, you know, we have a standard uh, project format, and you know that project format is like a modular format. So you kind of repeat that same project with different clients. Mm -hmm. But of course, because the organization is growing. Companies have different needs. The project size suddenly changes, so the contract suddenly changes, and you don't have enough people on the team. So you know you kind of have to adapt the contract, and of course, then you know the, the entire invoicing process you know is outsourced. So then to manage that expectation there, but this is just one part of it. The other part of it is certainly when you start having company uh, money coming into a corporate account or or a company account in China. Then suddenly there is a monthly audit that needs to be done. There is a quarterly audit that needs to be done. There is filing of uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, arrange like organization of invoices and FAPIAs uh, and expenses. There is uh, taxes you have to pay. There is you know <laughs> there's just a whole lot of stuff there. And you know I I I I don't think any anyone enjoys it. Particularly me, I don't enjoy it. Stick around, guys, because when you when we come back, we're gonna dive into how to grow a small business into a big corporation. All right, so previously we were just talking about, you know, scaling a business, a small business to a big corporation and some of the problems that come with registration. So my next couple of questions is, so for the beginner, one person entrepreneur, what is the first three things that they should do when wanting to start a business here in China? First three things. Um, I think before anyone even starts a business in China, and this is my personal feedback, I think a lot of people come here because they just want to sell stuff, and I think the aim should not be to sell stuff. There's enough shit out there to buy. I think what really should be focused, what they should really focus on before starting any business, is really how does what I intend to sell add value to the world today, right? I mean, am I just selling a plastic bottle? Am I sending selling a bar of soap? Am I selling a tampon? I mean, how does what I do bring value to uh, you know to 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 what I see around mm. me? So, and I think that's the basic question. Mm. Most people just start a business because they want to make money, mm. but is that really the point? You know, not really. So, for number one is intent. No, number one is intent. What's you know, intent. Agree? Number two is customer. customer. I mean, everyone comes here that hey, you know, I'm going to start selling cookies to the foreigners, mm. but we have to remember, you know, we are in China, and the goal should be to do something for people here, mm. right? I mean, how is it that what you do makes sense or brings value to someone living in this country? So, I mean, focus on, on Chinese people, right? I mean, it's not like you can't get wealthy by, by selling it to, to Chinese people. It's just that it requires more planning. You have to be more meticulous. Uh, it, you have to be better organized. And you have to really know your shit, right? And then st start focusing on value. So, intent for the right audience, you know, bring in the right thing. It'll really, really make, uh, you know, a lot of value. Mm. And the third thing is, I think, uh, having the right brand, the right communication, mm. uh, the right story, um, that really makes a sense, makes a difference. So then I want to hop on, on your second point. You know, if you said, you know, 
creating something that's geared towards Chinese people. Yeah. And it's been difficult as a foreigner because when they're first coming here, they don't know anything about yeah. anything about this right. country, right? Yeah. They don't know, they may or may not know the language. Yeah. So for someone in particular who doesn't know the language, how do they introduce themselves or their products to the Chinese market? I, I, think, um, I think the key here really is that a lot of people come with ideas, right? Whether it's in the West, whether it's in India, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the US. Ah, oh, you know, I love that shit. I'm going to sell it in China. Uh. But I, I think that's exactly the wrong attitude, right? You want to come here, spend some time in the country, work in a company, understand the challenges, under the, understand the opportunities. Maybe you'll change your mind. Maybe that, that bottle of, that brand of vodka you wanted to sell is not a good idea after all, because maybe Chinese people don't like vodka, mm -hmm. right? So I, I really think if someone really wants to start a business, and I think, uh, the, I, I think the real businessman should at least spend one year in China, mm. number one, learning Chinese, mm. because that's what prepares you for the long haul. Like I've been here for seven years and my biggest regret is that I never had time to learn the language. Mm. You know, I, I always had a job. Mm. And because I always had a full-time job, I never really had the time to focus on the language. So do you, learn, do you know the language now? Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak uh, conversational mm. Mandarin. I can, I can get along, people cannot bullshit me. Mm. But at the same time, it's a challenge. I can't read and write, you know. Mm. I, I can't speak it as fluently as I would like mm. to. If, for example, if I could do this interview in Chinese, it would be my dream, you know. Oh, so I would suggest, uh, I think the best thing would be spend the first six months or one year working with a local company and learning the language. And I think for me, working with a local company really helped. Uh, I spent the first one year working with a Chinese branding agency that really helped. But I think the language, because it was a Chinese branding agency and I was so busy, uh, I never had time to learn the language in the way I should have learned it. Mm -hmm. And which I really think the way to learn it is six months intensive university five days a week yeah, six months to a year um see, me personally i think i'm going to looking back on this interview i'm going to regret you know not learning chinese so i've I'm only been here for about 10 months and i'm going to leave in a couple of months actually mm -hmm. so um and i didn't have enough time just like you to learn the language because i'm out here working right and then you know doing my projects right. this is not enough time to learn right. chinese but i would say that in shanghai and Shanghai, just Shanghai, you can get away with not learning yeah. Chinese. You know, you to, can get to away what, with it, yeah. what extent do you think that's true that you can actually? Because personally, anything that I need done in Chinese, I ask for help with it, or right. I outsource right. it, or like yeah. if I need to translate something on video for a client, I'll just. Right. But do you think you can really get away in Shanghai alone? I see. I, I'm not saying you can't do without Chinese, mm. but I think if you are the entrepreneur or the boss or the laoban or the leader who can speak the local language, mm. it puts you at a Basically. unique advantage, and it really. Maybe it, it, it could be debatable, but it really would help you speed up your growth and your progress or maybe shorten the, you know, the, the, the startup phase in the sense. So I, I think it really makes a big difference mm. speaking the language. Like, you know, I have a full time job. My, my boss has been here for 17 years. His Mandarin is fluent. And I mean, the kind of connection he can have with his Chinese employees or it makes a lot of difference, you know, as opposed to him having an assistant or someone else who has to speak his language because he can now communicate his thoughts directly to his uh, to his team mm -hmm. that really makes a difference like m my boss and I like we, are, we the two of us are the only foreigners in our company which of 20 people you know mm. so I want to get more into what you actually do um, dad I had the question in my head but now I forgot it first off yeah what is reset in the UK yeah. I know you launched uh, yeah. initiative called reset. how did you get that I got, I got, <laughs> on a, on I got, I got my sources I got my sources <laughs> all right uh, so, I mean, on one hand, yes, I've been talking about Green Initiatives, uh, which is in a startup phase, mm. uh, a non-profit organization focused on environmental education. Uh, but that's just one of my jobs. I also have a full-time job. Mm. I always say I have two full-time jobs uh, with a company called Giga. And uh, Giga has been around in Shanghai for about eight years. My boss, uh, my boss has been here for about 17 years. And Giga initially started as a, as a platform for sharing uh, knowledge and information on healthy building materials mm. through software and through, through, a, through a technology platform. Um, and I think it just so happened that over time, uh, it really grew. Uh, the market really needed this kind of information. And combined with the fact that our GIGA's work was focused on software and technology, um, and combined with you know, the, the worsening air quality in China, we started focusing on software that helps uh, monitor the air quality. And now it's been eight years. Uh, a lot of our work has been focused on software and a lot on data, uh, but basically focused on data that can help create healthy buildings. Mm. And while we were working on all these things, uh, we realized that what is a healthy building or what is good data? And we realized that there was no standards out there mm. that would actually tell you that, hey, your space is healthy or your space is not healthy. 
So we actually had to create the entire standard for what is good data, what is a healthy space, what is a good hardware, you know, what is the right software. And this entire standard that we created is called Reset. So Reset is a, uh, a lot of people know about Lead. For example, Lead is a, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the building industry, Lead is the biggest name for green building design. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's like a standard, a set of standards to design green buildings. Mm. So Reset is similar to Lead in the sense that it's a standard, but Reset is focused on designing healthier buildings. So not just buildings that save water or, you know, like, or, or, sa or, or save energy, mm -hmm. but buildings that are the focused on the health of people using that building. Can you give some specific like attributes of what a healthy building will consist of? Yeah, yeah. For example, right? I mean, uh, you look at the space here. You know, we have flooring, we have paint on the wall, we have lights, we have furniture, we have like you know laminates on the furniture. In general, a space could be unhealthy because of a few different reasons. Number one, if the pollution is really bad outside, the PM two point five is really uh, uh, high. For example, outside, then most of it comes inside the building because here buildings are not properly insulated. Mm. You can feel it in the winter, right? Mm. I mean, despite you closing all your doors and windows and turning on all the heaters, you know, the space still doesn't heat up or your energy bills are really high. And that's because there's a lot of, lot of leakage in your space. So out, uh, bad outdoor air quality, a lot of air pollution outside also means air pollution inside your house. That's number one. Number two, fresh air, right? Um, because you close all your doors and windows because you're worried about the air quality outside, but you close all the doors and windows, so your house actually becomes like a, like a zone for, for, you know, like stale air, let's say. So that's the second problem. The third thing is chemicals. So all the paints and the varnishes and the laminates that you see, they all contain chemicals. And a lot of these things, they come continuously emit or off-gas chemicals for a long time. So now suddenly you have bad PM2.5. Uh, you have, sorry, uh, you have bad air quality because of the, uh, of the PM2.5. You have stale air because all your doors and windows are closed. And you have chemicals in your space as well because of the materials. So, so question, so your corporation, uh, Green Initiatives, does it, it doesn't speak to the general consumer though. It speaks to the people building it. So we're talking about two things here. We're talking about two oh, things sorry, here. Sorry, sorry, let me go back. Reset. Giga, Reset. Giga. Or Reset. Reset, Reset is the initiative. Sorry. Reset yeah. was an initiative that was launched in the UK. So that initiative, that speaks to the architects. Who does that speak to? Um, so Reset is, is, uh, is mainly focused on, uh, uh, on, on two kinds of audience. One is people who inhabit spaces. So for example, offices, mm -hmm. international schools, restaurants, hotels, you know, those kind of places. And the number two uh, is building owners. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, this might be an office building and there is a big developer who owns the entire building. Now this developer wants to differentiate himself from his competitors by offering good air quality mm -hmm. to his tenants. Now, I'm, so. I'm assuming the problem is, especially in China, maybe you experience this or not, everything, everybody wants everything for a cheaper price. Yeah. I'm assuming you know, the infrastructure and the architecture that, you know, that you're, you're describing is kind of expensive. Uh, so no, so I, so th so that's the main difference in what we do and how we do it. Okay. Because the way we do it is, it's completely technology based, and it's completely performance based. Which means that, uh, for example, again I keep referring to lead. So lead is focused all, a lot on checklists. So you have to hire a consultant. Mm. You have to give him a list of items that he has to do. Check, check, check. Oh, this is going to take time. I go source this, etc., etc. So it's a lot of manual work. But Reset, on the other hand, it's completely focused on sensors and technology. Mm -hmm. So you install sensors in your space, you connect them to the software, and you start getting data. Mm -hmm. So it's much more quicker and much more uh, you know, efficient. Mm -hmm. So that really, really brings down the cost barrier. Mm -hmm. Like right now, we're working with some of the biggest developers globally. Uh, we're working with big banks, uh, big uh, multinational organizations, international schools. And for them, you know, when you compare the, the money that they put in to getting an idea of the air quality, versus the number of people that they serve and the kind of operational overheads, it's very, very uh, minimal. And we have to also remember that in most, uh, in most, uh, most organizations, the 95% of the operation cost is on people's salary, right? Mm. So, I mean, where, where do you spend most of your money? It's rent, it's energy bills, and it's salaries. Mm. But people don't realize, I mean, the bigger organizations now realize, is that when you have bad air quality, or when you have a bad, unhealthy space, your people are falling sick, they're lacking in productivity, they so ultimately they're losing money. So if 95% of your operational cost is salaries, and the space is unhealthy, and, you're, sp and, and you know, you're losing money because your employees are unhealthy, you're drinking a lot of coffee in the afternoon because there's not enough fresh air, ah. that means you're losing money in the entire picture, right? 
So that's why the banks, the multinationals, the consulting companies, they're the earliest to realize this, that good air, healthy air also means healthy employees, less insurance bills, more productivity, and you know, uh, it, it kind of makes sense to them. So it's kind of an investment, so to say. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's really good to know. So what is the current state of China right now in terms of, you know, our, in, in terms of these healthy buildings? What's the current state and what, where do we need to be in terms of like maybe five years, ten years? Uh, I, I think it's, um, I think the problem is uh, recognized everywhere, uh, uh, in the, everywhere in China. I think people realize that that is a problem. Uh, if there's one thing people are concerned about here before anything is air, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whether it's in your house, everyone started buying filters. Whether you go to your offices, everyone started buying filters. So clearly the awareness is there. Um, and, but it's also the very, very, it's also the, the starting point, you know. It's not mature enough yet in the sense that people realize the problem, but everyone thinks, like you, that the, that the solution is expensive. Mm. But they don't know that there are efficient, cost-effective solutions. Mm. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, we don't sell hardware, we don't sell, we don't sell software. Our focus is on putting together the standard. And then we put you in touch with 10 different people and you can talk to them and you can work your way out with whoever you think is the most cost efficient. Mm. But our goal is to provide you the tools, the knowledge and the standards. Mm. You figure it out um, and we'll help you figure it out. Mm. But uh, I, I, think it's, it's, um, I think there's a long way to go. But uh, I think it's, it's very much possible and it's all going to happen. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, our standard is just like two or three years old. And in two or three years, we're already working with some of the big brands. Uh, and, and again, they realize the value. Mm. So I, I don't think there's an option, but I think in the next five years, it's going to be catching a lot of momentum. And I think a lot of, um, we always say that now the market is shifting from green buildings to healthy buildings. Green buildings is the past now. Green buildings is minimal. Yes, you have to have green buildings. Like every new project in, in China now is either LEED certified or it's China three star certified, which are both green building standards. So it's become a trend now. And I think the future trend is going to be healthy buildings. So how can you ensure that your buildings are healthy for people who are using it? And that's going to become a trend. When we get back, we'll let you know how you can make a difference. You know, um, I would like to know what drew you to this industry? What, what was your origins in this industry? Uh, you mean my full-time job, which is about like air quality and healthy buildings, or my non-profit, which is focused on environmental education? Well, it is kind of... Well, I, from my perspective, it's kind of the same, um, like sustainability, you know, eco-friendly yeah. kind of industry. What kind of drew you? What inspired you to, you know, to want to pursue this? Um, I, I, I think it started with. I think primarily it was my growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a boarding school in India, mm -hmm. in the south of India, which I always say was like Harry Potter's Hogwarts. So I grew up in like a really, really incredible, incredibly beautiful environment, and I kind of took nature and the environment for granted back then. And I think it just so happened that once I started, once I, you know, I, I finished my high school, I started living in a big city in India. And, you know, I kind of started falling sick a lot more often. Uh, I was studying architecture. So it kind of naturally, there was an environmental angle to it. And I think my final year thesis when I was studying architecture was, you know, coincidentally a project that had sustainability at its core. I was designing a school which had to be sustainable in a certain way. And out of a class of 40, I was the only one who kind of had a project which had anything to do with uh, sustainable design. And I think two things kind of made a difference there. I think one was, I mean, I was like, this should be normal, you know. Mm. Why, is, why am I the only one who's working on something which makes more sense from an environmental perspective, number one. Number two, whatever I did, it was received really, really well. I mean, I even won a national award for my thesis after that. Mm. And it almost was like, this should be so normal, you know, why, why isn't the focus on, focus more on something like this, which is sustainable design, sustainable architecture, sustainable living. And secondly, I mean, you know, it should be the norm. So I think that kind of started like getting me thinking. Uh, the award, of course, motivated me to work a little bit more on this. But after I moved, uh, af after India, I moved to Singapore. I worked there a little bit. So I kind of got a little bit more experience on, uh, on sustainability focused uh, design. I was even in India before I moved to Singapore. I was working with a company that did a lot of work on restoration, so converting old, old buildings into, into like really nice uh, contemporary projects with a sustainability angle. Uh, so I, I think step by step that really kind of drew, uh, changed my thinking. But I think the, the, miles, the, the turning point really was me coming to Shanghai and doing green drinks and green initiatives. And step by step in the last seven years, we've organized about 300 events, attended by more than 15,000 people. 
and had more than 100 or 200 speakers at, speak at our events. And every time, and we've had about 75 film screenings as well. So imagine I've been in 90% of these events and there's so much of information I've learned through this that kind of keeps pushing me towards doing more of this. And now, suddenly seven years later, I'm like, but it doesn't make sense because all these things that I've been doing for the last seven years are again very, very normal. These are things that should have been taught to us in schools, but even me studying in a really good school in India, I was never taught about this. And that's, that, that kind of keeps pushing me even further on, on ensuring that education is a key part of what we do. Because if I had all this information when I was growing up, I could have probably saved some time and you know, created impact faster, for example. But my, I think my problem is that sustainability at its core should be as fundamental and as basic as physics, chemistry and biology. You know, there should be physics, chemistry, biology and ecology. And that should be like a, like a chapter in school, in any school globally. But it's somehow forgotten. Climate change, global warming. I learned it when I was like 30 years old or 27 years old. This should have been, maybe it's India, maybe it's, you know, not the West, but even in China, a lot of them, they don't know this when they're growing up. So I think for me, as you can see, it was a series of different incidents that kind of grew me to it. But for me, it was almost like the more I worked into it, the more I worked in it, the more I kind of got drawn into it and not be able to do something about it. So what really saddens me is you mentioned this earlier is that everybody's aware that Shanghai has one of the worst pollutions in the world. Um, everybody's aware of how you know deeply affected we are by global warming. We're all, we're all aware of the issue now. But the truth of the matter is, after this interview is done, I'm going to go, I'm going to take a 20-minute shower, I'm going to keep all the lights on, I'm going to charge my phone, I'm going to go to work, you know, on a motorbike. And we, we, we all, oh, it's saddening. But then we go out and live our lives. We go, yeah. so, you know, what is, what is the simplest thing, you know, people watching this right now, what is the simplest piece of action that is minimal, but it makes a large impact? Um... I think there are quite a few, but I think that's the thing with uh, sustainability, right? For years, sustainability has been treated as a niche. It has been treated as a, as a luxury. It has been, you know, it, it's been difficult or, or expensive, whether it's buying organic food, whether it's doing something else. And I think that's one of the problems, right? The sustainability, sustainable actions in general have been more challenging, more expensive and more inconvenient for people. So my thinking is that until you make sustainability easy, convenient and accessible and affordable for people, it's always going to remain a niche, you know. So you really have to make it easy and you have to really make it out there for people. But that's just generally like us as an organization, we're trying to make it more easy and, and, and you know, convenient for, for people to engage in it. But I think just in terms of people, in terms of people listening to this, I mean, where they can start is, I think the easiest way to start is just by understanding your own personal impact in what you do and what you consume and what you buy, what you do. I mean, I think buying less. Uh, it is, is really makes a lot of difference. Buying less in terms of what food, clothing, food. what? I mean, food, of course, you have to buy what you need, but at the same time, buying local, uh, buying from better brands, mm -hmm. uh, supporting local organizations, volunteering with local organizations, volunteering accountably mm -hmm. with local organizations, supporting local causes. I think community is really important. Mm -hmm. So yes, of course, one is, you know, be very conscious of what you consume, how you buy, where you buy, and who you buy it from. But at the same time, really support your community. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Remember that you, you, you know, your, your purpose of ex existence should be beyond you, you know. How can you change for the better, you know, the life of those around you? And I think very few people live with that mindset. Most people are so consumed by their own life and by their own actions, by their own consumption, that they forget that they're, you know, they're living in a certain framework, in a certain world where so many people don't have access to basic education, food and water. So the moment you start supporting organizations that are working towards bettering the life of people around, you know, it, it makes a lot of difference because once you start volunteering or once you start supporting local causes, you realize that gradually, you know, you're, I mean, you, you start changing as a person, you become much more empath, you know, you have more empathy, uh, you know, you, you become more patient and so on and so forth. So I think these are just some general advices. I, I would say, yeah, be conscious of how you consume, why you consume and how you can consume less. Uh, and second thing is start supporting local, you know, initiatives, start supporting your community. So, you've been working on this for eight years now. What if you had eight days to kind of really focus and get the message out? In eight days. I this, think is, this is a Tim Ferriss inspired question. No, Tim Ferriss? Uh, no. But Four hour work week. But if you, had, like, if you had eight days to really condense and get the message out, 
what one what will be the message how would you communicate it who would you communicate communicate it to i think i think the simple the first thing i would like to do is just create like a like a like a video which you're doing right now make it in chinese and get it on youtube or yoku you know on, on other local platforms second thing is do it in a way that is fun interesting and you know that people really see that hey you know sustainability is not about hugging a tree and it's not about uh, you know sacrificing my privileges or it's not about compromising but really coming up with a with a you know with a interesting way to tell people that sustainability is basic it's not hard and anyone can do it and being sustainable is not challenging um and and I, i think finding a way to communicate it to everyone uh, you know with the with the with the medium i think that really makes a difference as well uh and i think um it's for me i think it's it's a lot about education it's a lot about communication it's a lot about branding it's a lot about how you say your story and how you effectively you're able to get your story out so i would spend probably 8 days just in figuring out a strategy mm. uh, i mean in coming up with a strategy creating the content implementing it and you know like really proliferating in the community and that's what i would do in 8 days because that would survive beyond me as well you know so the work of 8 days can survive for 8 years after that if it's on a certain communication platform so yeah thank you so much for before I let you go i like to ask guys this one last question um what do you call shanghai in one word home right now home thank you so much and i'll see you guys in the next video be sure to subscribe and have a good day peace out